History is not simply about the passage of time. Of course, it is what people do and the changes that occur in society as a result of people's actions over time. The history of English can therefore be seen as a record of the changes that have occurred in the populations of those who speak the language. When two languages come into contact, what actually happens is that two communities who speak different languages engage with each other. And the nature of that engagement will determine how the languages influence one another. In other words, it is important when we study English not to forget that what we are actually studying is the language as it is and was used by real people. As I mentioned before, statistics like the one indicating that over 3 billion people speak English globally present a challenge because they draw sweeping conclusions about the character of the language and how speakers relate to one another. These figures will never be able to adequately capture the variety of experiences that language users have, whether it comes to their perceptions of what English is like or whether they believe themselves to be native speakers. In this section, therefore, I shall consider the role English plays in the lives of people in various parts of the world and look at how the opinions people hold about the language are related to their personal histories, to the history of their communities, and to their interpretations of the history of the language. Here is a short selection of extracts from English speakers from around the world who were asked the same questions. The first extract is from a woman who was born and brought up in Birmingham in the UK. She reflects here on her time since university and the influences on her use and perception of language during this period of her life. I went to university in Swansea and for the first time was first made aware of my English and apparently posh accent. My first job after leaving was in the northeast of England, and here I was perceived again for the first time as a southerner. In neither place was anyone able to place my place of birth from my accent. I think what I noticed most was that people made assumptions about my socioeconomic background purely on the basis of my accent or perceived lack of local accent and saw me as middle class, which was not how I saw myself. Since then, I have taught in various primary schools, mainly in Birmingham, where I am aware of my responsibilities of being a language role model, particularly where pupils are new or relatively new to English. Though I am back on home ground, in fact, teaching at the school I first attended, people still can't tell where I come from. The second excerpt is from a man who was born and brought up in Iran, but now lives in Ontario, Canada. His native language is Farsi, and between his childhood in Tehran and his current life in Canada, he also spent some time living in the UK. I was educated in a mixed Farsi and English language school until grade eight. My father was keen to send me to England for my education. In those days, a lack of university places and the annual university entrance competition were a major concern for parents. In 1978, just before the Iranian Revolution, I started my education at a college in Bedford, England. My minimal English in studying this subject further helped me to get through my coursework. Every year after finishing my O-levels and A-levels, I went to Liverpool University. I decided to study structural engineering with a view to going back to Iran one day. I had to learn a lot of engineering professional jargon like stress, strain, fatigue, moments, shear, curvature, etc. With my solid English background, I could put together the basic vocabulary, and without this, 
My understanding and learning of the structural engineering concepts and syllabus would have been impossible. After receiving my master's degree in 1992, I found a good position at the International Institute of Earthquake Engineering in Tehran, Iran. After 14 years, I was returning with not much Farsi ability to write at advanced levels. It took me almost one year to read and learn the engineering terms in Farsi, but I found out in some cases that the technical words were taken from the engineering literacy in English. The last passage comes from a woman who resides in London at the moment. She discusses her life's experiences living in the UK and Taiwan, where she was born. I was raised speaking Mandarin Chinese and was born in Taipei, Taiwan. I knew my alphabet up to K when I was 10 years old and moved to London for the first time with my family. My limited knowledge of English consisted of the words apple and hat, which I mispronounced as apple and H because of Taiwan's greater American influence. After I graduated from my fine art degree, I went to Taiwan to get reacquainted with Chinese culture. While I was there, I worked at an art gallery, an English language school, and a bilingual newspaper. Most of my Western friends were American. I was shocked to be labeled British. In order to work at the language school in Taiwan, I had to adapt my accent moderately so that kids didn't fail their KK the phonetic system used there. My accent was all mixed up. I remember being mistaken for being an Australian when I spoke to a British guy. I hated listening to the local American station and clung to BBC World Service for my sanity. I married an American and then moved back to the UK. I found work in East London at a university library. For the first time in my life, I became fascinated by the different accents I was coming across. Some of my colleagues are of proud East. And working class origin, some are from Essex, some are from the Midlands, the North, from Scotland, from Italy, Bulgaria, Kenya. Here we are in multicultural Britain. Not to mention the new slangs used by colleagues who are a decade or so younger than me or the foreign students we encounter from all over the world. What is noticeable from these stories is that everyone has a slightly different experience of the language and that their attitudes towards it depend on the specific context in which they are using it. Often as people pass through different stages in their lives, and especially as they move from one place to another, these attitudes will alter and their own language practices will adapt to their new environment. For all the interviewees, however, English is not only important as a means of communication, but as part of the way they see themselves and how they are perceived by others. So, as we can see, the attitudes people have towards the language are a part of their own personal history. But this personal history is always a part of the wider history of the community in which they live. It is often the case that not only is the language of importance to the individual's sense of identity, but that it also plays a part in the cultural identity of a group or nation. It is within this context that the history of English, and especially the reasons behind its global spread, can be of great significance for the attitudes people have towards the language. The development of the language is influenced by social forces. Decisions about the language made by institutions such as national governments and education systems have an impact on the form of the language and on the way it is perceived and used. In contexts such as these, English cannot simply be considered a neutral medium of communication. Instead, it is a politically charged social practice embedded in the histories of the people who use it. 
Conclusion This chapter has demonstrated the diversity of the English language, which it has always been. Since it first came to the British Isles from Northern Europe centuries ago, it has undergone significant change, to the point where the language spoken then is nearly unintelligible to us today. The language has continued to evolve as it has left Britain, changing in various ways depending on the situation. It has diversified to such an extent that some scholars suggest that it is no longer accurate to talk of a single English, that instead there are many different English languages around the world. Today, at the same time, however, English exists in the world today as a means of international communication, as a way for people from different social groups to communicate with each other. And to fulfill this function, it would seem that variation in the language needs to be curtailed to a certain extent. That is to say, language will cease to be mutually understandable among various social groups if it becomes overly diverse. We therefore have two impulses at work that appear to be incompatible, if not at odds, and the challenge is to make them both consistent enough that they constitute a single entity that we shall refer to as English. As a language with a global scope that is involved in the history and contemporary existence of societies all over the world, English currently holds an unprecedented position in the world. For this reason, this is one of the main issues in English language studies today, and it is also a very modern issue,